But you're kind of suggesting that there might be a like a, a community thing that pops up, like a, like um, as opposed to uh, an angry revolution, it might have a positive effect of. Well, for example, are you telling me that if the right person stood up and called for us to sacrifice PPE uh, for our nurses and our, our our MDs who are on the front lines, that like people wouldn't reach down deep in their own supply that they've been like stocking and carefully storing there and just say, like, say, here, take it. Like right now, an actual leader would use this time to bring out the heroic character. And I'm going to just go wildly patriotic because I freaking love this country. We've got this dormant population in the US that loves leadership and country and pride in our freedom and not being told what to do. And we still have this thing that binds us together. And all of the, the merchants of division just be gone. I, I totally agree with you. There's a, I think there is a deep hunger for that leadership. Why hasn't that, why, why hasn't one arisen? Because we don't have the right surgeon general. We have a guy saying, you know, come on, guys, don't buy masks. They don't really work for you. Save them for our healthcare professionals. No, you, you can't do that. You have to say, you know what? These masks actually do work and they more work to protect other people from you, but they would work for you. They'll keep you somewhat safer if you wear them. Here's the deal. You've got somebody who's taking huge amounts of viral load all the time because the patients are shedding. Do you want to protect that person who's volunteered to be on the front line, who's up sleepless nights? You, you just change the message. You stop lying to people. You but, just yeah. you, you level with them. It's like Absolutely. it's bad. Absolutely, but that's uh, that's a little bit specific. So you you have to be just honest about the facts of the situation. Yes, Who? but I, I think you were referring to something bigger than just that. Yeah, it's inspiring, like you know, rewriting the constitution. <laughs> sort of rethinking how we work as a nation. Yeah, and, I think you should probably, you know, amend the constitution once or twice in a lifetime so that you don't get this distance from the foundational documents. And, you know, part of the problem is, is that we've got two generations on top that feel very connected to the US. They feel bought in. And we've got three generations below. It, it's a little bit like watching your parents riding the tricycle that they were supposed to pass on to you. And it's like, you're now too old to ride a tricycle and they're still whooping it up, ringing the bell with the streamers coming off the handlebars. And you're just thinking, do you guys never get bored? Do you never pass a torch? Do you really want it? We had five septuagenarians, all born in the forties, running for president of the United States when Klobuchar dropped out. The youngest was Warren. We had Warren, Biden, Sanders, Bloomberg, and Trump from like 1949 to 1941 all who have been the, the oldest president at inauguration. And nobody, nobody says, grandma and grandpa, you're embarrassing us. <laughs> Except Joe Rogan. Let me put it on you. You have a big platform. You're somewhat of an intelligent, eloquent guy. What, what role do you, somewhat, what <laughs> role do you play? Why aren't you that leader? Well, you're, I mean, I would argue that you're in, in ways becoming that leader. So, so I haven't taken enough risk. Is that your idea? What should I do or say at the moment? No, you're a little bit, no, you have taken quite a big risks and yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it. All right. But you're also on the outside sh shooting in, meaning um, you're uh, dismantling the institution from the outside as opposed to becoming well, the institution. Do you remember that thing you brought up when you were on The View? The View? I'm sorry, when you were on Oprah? I didn't make, I didn't get the invite. I'm sorry, when you were on Bill Maher's program, what was that Bill thing Maher. you were saying? <laughs> uh, <laughs> they don't know we're here. They may watch us. Yeah. They may quietly t uh, you know, slip us a, a direct message. But they pretend that this internet thing is uh, some dangerous place where only lunatics play. Well, who has the bigger platform, the portal or Bill Maher's program or The View? Bill Maher and The View. Uh, in terms of viewership or in terms of, what's the metric of size? Well, first of all, the key thing is um, 
take a, take a newspaper and even imagine that it's completely fake, okay? And then there's very little in the way of circulation. Yet imagine that it's a hundred year old paper and that it's still part of this game, this internal game of media. The key point is, is that those sources that have that kind of um, mark of respectability to the institutional structures matter in a way that even if I say something on a very large platform that makes a lot of sense, if it's outside of what I've called the gated institutional narrative or gin, it sort of doesn't make matter to the institutions. So the game is, if it happens outside of the club, we can pretend that it never happened. How can you get the credibility and the authority from outside the, the gated institutional narrative? I'm, well, first of all, you, you and I both share um, institutional credibility coming from our associations. So you, we were both at MIT. Yes. Were you at Harvard at Harvard. any point? Nope. Okay, well. I lived in Harvard Square. So did I. <laughs> but, you know, at some level, it, the issue isn't whether you have credentials in that sense. The key question is, can you be trusted to file a flight plan and not deviate from that flight plan when you are in an interview situation? Will you stick to the talking points? I will not. Yeah. And that's why you're not going to be allowed in the general conversation, which amplifies these sentiments. But, but I'm still trying to. Uh... So your your point it would be is that we're let's say both. So you've done how many Joe Rogan? Four. I've done four too. Right. So both of us are somewhat frequent guests. The show is huge. You know the power as well as I do. And people are going to watch this conversation. Uh, huge number watched our last one. By the way, that. I want to thank you for that one. That was a terrific, terrific conversation. Really did change my life. Lex, changed you're my a bri life. You're a brilliant interviewer. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. That was that you changed my life too. That you gave me a chance. So that was no, no, no. I'm so glad I did that one. What I would say is, is that we keep mistaking how big the audience is for whether or not you have the kiss, and the kiss is a different thing. Kiss. What yeah. does that stand for? Well, it doesn't it's not an acronym yet. Okay. Um, it's uh, thank you for asking. It's a question of are you part of the inter interoperable institution friendly discussion? And that's the discussion which we ultimately have to break into. But that's what I'm trying to get at is how do we how do you, how does Eric Weinstein become the president of the United States? Meaning, I shouldn't become the president of the United States. Not interested. Thank you very much for asking. Okay. Get into a leadership position where, I guess I don't know what that means, but where you can inspire millions of people to uh, the inspire the sense of community, inspire the, the kind of actions required to overcome hardship, the kind of hardship that we may be experiencing, to inspire people to work hard and face the difficult hard facts of the realities we're living through, all those kinds of things that you're talking about. That leader, you know, can that leader emerge from the current institutions? Or can, alternatively, can it also emerge from the outside? I guess that's what I was asking. So my belief is, is that this is the last hurrah for the elderly centrist kleptocrats. <laughs> can you uh, define each of those terms? Okay. Elderly, I mean, people who were born at least a year uh, before I was. That's a joke, you can laugh. Uh, no, because I'm born at the cusp of the Gen X boomer divide. So. Yeah. Um, centrist, they're pretending, you know, that there are two parties, Democrat and Republican Party in the United States. I think it's easier to think of the mainstream of both of them as part of a, an aggregate party that I sometimes call the looting party which gets us to kleptocracy, which is ru ruled by thieves. And the great temptation has been to treat the US like a trough and you just have to get yours because it's not like we're doing anything productive. So everybody's uh, sort of looting the family mansion and somebody stole the silver and somebody's cutting the pictures out of the frames. And, you know, roughly speaking, we're watching our elders uh, <laughs> live it up in a way that doesn't make sense to the rest of us. Okay, so if it's la the last hurrah, this is the time for leaders to step up. Like, well, I, no, I'm, no, we're not ready yet. We're not ready. I, I just Seriously, disagree I with just, that. I call, I call out. You know, the head of the CDC should resign. Should resign. The head, 
the Surgeon General should resign. Trump should resign. Pelosi should resign. De Blasio should resign. They're not going to resign. I understand that. So that's but, why. So we'll, we'll wait. No, but that, that's not how revolutions work. You don't wait for people to resign. You uh, step up and inspire the alternative. Do you remember the Russian Revolution of 1907? It's before my time. <laughs> but there wasn't a Russian Revolution of 1907. So you're thinking we're in 1907, not I'm 1917. I'm saying we're too, you're too early. But we got this, you know, Spanish flu came in 17, 18. So I would argue that there's a lot of parallels there. World War One. I think it's not time yet. Like John Prine, the uh, the songwriter, just died of COVID. That was a pretty big. Really? Yeah. You By know? the way, you yes, of course. I uh, <laughs> every every time we do this, uh, we discover our our mutual appreciation of obscure, brilliant, witty uh, songwriter. Well, he's really he's really quite good, right? He's he's really good. Yeah, he died. He My died. understanding is that he passed recently due to complications of uh, corona. So we haven't had large enough, enough large, large enough shocking deaths yet. Picturesque deaths, deaths of a family that couldn't get treatment. There are stories that will come and break our hearts. And we have not had enough of those. The visuals haven't come in. But I think they're coming. Well, we'll find out. But that you gotta, you have to be there. You have to be there when they come. I mean, I, but we didn't get the visual, for example, of falling man from nine eleven. Right. So the outside world did, but Americans were not. It was thought that we would be too delicate. So just the way you remember Pulitzer Prize winning photographs from the Vietnam era, you don't easily remember the photographs from all sorts of things that have happened since, because something changed in our media. We are insensitive. We cannot feel or uh, experience our own lives and the tragedy that would animate us to action. Yeah, but I, I think there, again, I think there's going to be that suffering that's going to build and build and build in terms of businesses, mom and pop shops that close. And I like, I think for myself, I think often like that I'm being weak and, and, and um, like, I feel like I should be doing something like yeah. I should be becoming a leader on a small scale. You can't. This is not World War II, and this is not Soviet Russia. Why not? Why not? I because mean, our internal programming, the malware that sits between our ears, is f much different than the propagandized malware of uh, the Soviet era. I mean, people were both very indoctrinated and also knew that at some level it was BS. They had a, a double mind. I don't know, I mean, there must be a great word in Russian for being able to think uh, both of those things simultaneously. You don't think people are actually sick of the partisanship, sick of incompetence? Yeah, but, but I also, called for revolt the other day on Joe Rogan, and people found it quixotic. Well, because I think you're not, <laughs> I think revolt is different. I think ask like um okay I'm really angry. Yes. I'm so I'm furious. I cannot stand that this is my country at the moment. I am embarrassed. So let's build a, a better one. Yeah. Right? That's the I'm in. <laughs> okay, so well okay, I mean, but th like, that's something let, I So think let's about take over a few universities. Let, let's start running a different experiment at yeah, some of our better exactly. universities. Like when I did this experiment and I said what at this if this were 40 years ago, the median age, I believe, of a university president was 51. That would have the person in Gen X, and we'd have a bunch of millennial presidents, a bunch of, you know, ha more than half Gen X. It's almost 100% baby boom at this point. Um, and how did that happen? We can get into how they changed retirement, but this generation above us does not feel or even, even the older generation, silent generation. I had Roger Penrose on my program. Excellent conversation. And I, thank you, really appreciate that. And I asked him a question that was very important to me. I said, look, you're in your late eighties. Is there anyone you could point to as a successor that we should be watching? We can get excited. I, you know, I said, here's an opportunity to pass the baton. And he said, well, let me, let me hold off on that. I was like, oh, are you? Is, is it ever the right moment to point to somebody younger than you to keep your flame alive after you're gone? And also, like, I don't know whether, 
I'm, I'm just going to admit to this. People treat me like I'm crazy for caring about the world after I'm dead. <laughs> or, or wanting to be remembered after you're gone. Like, well, what does it matter to you? You're gone. It's this deeply sort of secular somatic perspective on everything where we, we don't, you, you know that phrase in uh, As Time Goes By? It says, it's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. I don't think people imagined then that there wouldn't be a story about fighting for love and glory. And like, we are so out of practice about fighting, you know, rivals for love and, and, uh, and, uh, and fighting for glory in something bigger than yourself. But the hunger is there. Well, that was the point then, right? The whole idea is that Rick was, you know, he was like Han Solo of his time. He's just like, I stick my neck out for nobody. You know, it's like, oh, come on, Rick. You're just pretending you actually have a big soul, right? And so at some level, that's the question. Do we have a big soul or is it just all bullshit? See, I think, I think there's huge Manhattan Project style projects, whether you talk about physical infrastructure or going to Mars, you know, the SpaceX, NASA efforts or huge, huge scientific efforts. Well, we need to get back into the institutions and we need to remove the weak leadership that we have weak leaders and the weak leaders need to be removed and they need to seat people more dangerous than the people who are currently sitting in a lot of those chairs. Or build new institutions. Good luck. (laughs) Well, uh, so one of the nice things of, uh, from the internet is for example, somebody like you can have a bigger voice than almost anybody at the particular institutions we're talking about. That's true. But the thing is, I might say something. You can count on the fact that the, you know, provost at Princeton isn't going to say anything. What do you mean? To, to afraid? To well, if, the, if, if that person were to give an interview, how are things oh. going in, in, in research at Princeton? Well, I'm hesitant to say it, but they're perhaps as good as they've ever been, and I think they're going to get better. Oh, is that right? All fields? Yep. I, I don't see a weak one. You know, it's just like, okay, great. Who are you and what, what are you even saying? We're just used to total nonsense 24-7. Yeah. 